So we carry on with our uh, series that we started a while back called I Wish Jesus Never Said That. And when you look at the, tonight's title for tonight's message, it might shock you a little bit because you think that God is a God who unites and that He does. Uh, but God can also be a divisive God and we'll look deeper into that and, uh, and see what God has to say to us tonight. You know, it's been about 2,000 years since Jesus walked this earth and ever since then there have been so many various opinions about who he was and then what his purpose was, was when he was on this earth. And when we kicked off this series a couple of months ago, we said, for example, that Jesus was the only one to claim that he was God and that he was the only way to God. And in today's society, that is such a highly controversial claim. Uh, but since then, we've examined some of Jesus' sayings that are either very controversial because they go against the grain of our prevailing culture and thinking in today's world. So whether you're a Christian or not today, friends, Jesus might shift the framework or the lens through which you actually view him tonight. And we're hoping that he will do that. Popular culture over the last century or so have tended to portray Jesus through you know, various kinds of paintings and murals uh, as, as this kind of figure, as like almost Swedish-esque like Jesus with blonde hair and, and blue eyes and a little few kids around him petting sheep and he seems to have this glow around him as if he stepped out of a, of a nuclear factory. Uh, and so those seem to be the most popular portrayals of Jesus. Or the other way he's been portrayed as well is some sort of figure in, in history who kind of birthed a movement, you know, just like so many other figures. But what we are looking at tonight, friends, might jolt you and shake you up a little bit because you wouldn't really think that Jesus would say something like this. In fact, what he said in today's passage that we're going to look at might seem to actually contradict some of his own teachings. And the only way we can actually begin to understand what he says will require us to understand two things, okay, two things. Firstly, we need to grapple that with the very essence of who we are, we are fallen, okay, and we are sinful. And so we aren't just good people who occasionally do bad things. And we've said that quite often. We, in the very essence of of our nature are rotten to the core compared to, to who God is. And so even if we have any semblance of good in us, it is because we bear the image of God and however tarnished that image might be. And this book that we call the Bible actually affirms that so many times. In Romans 3, for example, 10 to 12, Paul says, No one is righteous, not one. No one understands. No one seeks after God. All have turned aside. Together we have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Okay, so if we, if, we, if we don't begin to grasp that, we actually won't understand what Jesus is trying to say to us. And then secondly, when God himself, the perfect, the righteous, the holy, the blameless God, who is the complete opposite of who we are, decides to invade our space, okay, when he decides to interject into human history, he is bound to cause some sort of division amongst people. And the reason is, he isn't just coming to do a patch-up job. He isn't just coming to bandage wounds. He is actually changing and transforming our hearts and the very essence of who we are. And so the very perspectives and our way of life for those people who are transformed by Jesus is going to be in direct opposition with those who are still trapped in their sinful nature and with those who haven't actually been changed by God. And because of that, that is bound to cause some sort of division. And so we're going to look at that tonight. And so with these two frameworks and lenses in mind, let's look at what Jesus said in Matthew 10, verse 34 to 39. And these are definitely one of the things that we wish Jesus never said. He said, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And so those are very stark and seemingly harsh words from Jesus. 
And so in order for us to understand it, we really need to just open up our hearts tonight and submit it and surrender to what the Holy Spirit wants to do in us. So let's just spend a few moments in prayer and just asking God to really reveal himself to us. Father, we just thank you so much that your word just seems so contrary to our own human nature. But at the end of the day, they are life-giving and you gave us life through your son Jesus. And when he spoke these words 2,000 years ago, they might seem to go against the grain of who we are, Lord. But we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would just soften our hearts, show us what you mean when you say these harsh and difficult words. And at the end of it all, may we be truly encouraged by who you are and what you've done for us, Father. So we commit our hearts and our minds to your hands now. And in Jesus' mighty name, amen. So the first thing that comes to, no, to mind when you read this is, doesn't the Bible actually say somewhere that Jesus is the Prince of Peace? We've all heard that before, right? In fact, the Bible does say that he is the Prince of Peace. So how come could he say that I have not come to bring peace, but a sword? How could he even say that? Because it seems to contradict what he says earlier and what Scripture seems to testify about him. Well, we've got to recognize what kind of peace he's actually talking about here. Does knowing Jesus and having an intimate relationship with him bring you peace, you know, in the midst of life's storms and uncertainties? Well, absolutely. We know that it does. Those of us who've, who've experienced him know that he does bring us peace when, when times are tough. And if not, then perhaps we don't really have a close relationship with him. But the more Christ-like we become, the more our ways, friends, tend to be contrary to the ways of those who are not in Christ and therefore a peaceful relationship with those people who don't know him might not necessarily be guaranteed. In fact, often it is, it is not guaranteed. In fact, if anything, we should not be surprised if there is some degree of tension or animosity with those people who don't know Jesus. It is so expected to be so when two opposing worldviews are clashing against each other. And if we are to be honest and stick to the testimony of Scripture, Tonight, friends, it is a clash of a kingdom of darkness and a kingdom of light. When these two things are at loggerheads, there is bound to be some sort of division. And so the first thing we can observe already in looking at this text tonight is that following Jesus might cost us some relationships. Following Jesus might actually cost us some relationships. Now, this might seem a really hard pillow to swallow, especially with those who we are very very close to, and even those who are our own family members, our moms, our dads, brothers and sisters, extended family, and those who we have known for a couple of decades. And Jesus is so clear in verse 35 and 36 that following him might put us at odds against our own parents and against our own kids and against our own siblings and our extended relatives as well. The question is, why does this have to be so? Why does it have to be like this? Can't we all just somehow, you know, get along and make sure we're all united in some way? The reason that this has to be so is because those of us who've been saved and rescued and transformed by Jesus, it isn't that simply our ideas have changed or the way we think has changed, but rather our very hearts have been transformed. The very core of our being has changed. And God's powerful work by His Spirit in transforming our sinful hearts that is in compliance with the way of this world to a heart that yearns after God and living out His ways will automatically be in opposition to those who have not experienced God's grace and transforming power in His lives. It's not as if you are kind of purposely seeking to divide, you know, relationships and actively, actively seeking out to be divisive, but rather it's your transformed heart that is purposely and actively seeking God that will or might might result in division with some of your relationships. Are you experiencing some of this in some of your relationships today? Because even if you've only walked with Jesus for a certain period of time, chances are this is bound to happen. And so how do we deal with this painful scenario? How do we navigate through this? The answer is we don't. The answer is we actually don't because that tension exists for a reason. The reason why some of our relationships are divisive, if you're truly following Jesus, is that it exists for a reason. We cannot actively seek to somehow compromise our beliefs and our way of life because that will be so contrary to the new nature that we have in Christ 
And Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 5.17. He says, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. The new life has begun. And this new life will be with some of our relationships in direct opposition to them. This means that we don't look like the world anymore because we don't belong to the world anymore. This means that we don't act like the world anymore because we are not of this world anymore. And so we don't actively seek to deal with this tension, but rather continue pursuing Christ. But rather continue pursuing Christ because the very fact that His people are different from the world is an example to the world how different God is to the world. Let me say that again. The very fact that His people are different from the world is an example to the world that God Himself is very different to or from the world. The contrast becomes so stark, friends, and that tension and that animosity will continue to prevail until Jesus brings history to a close. Kirsten and I have a, have a mutual friend. Uh, she comes from a, a Muslim background. Uh, and when she met Jesus in her late teens, her life was radically transformed. It was changed to such an extent that, that her Muslim family disowned her. They kicked her out. She no longer was allowed to be part of the family, and so she had to live in isolation. And as much as that really hurt her, that she was separated from her family, her love for Jesus was way beyond that. And so as much as she tried to reach out to them, they wanted nothing to do with her, and that, that was a price that she had to pay. But I really want to bring this closer to home, because I'm hoping that tonight the Holy Spirit would, would heal some of those wounds that we have because of some of those divisions that are caused for Jesus' sake, because I feel like the Spirit is really nudging some of our hearts tonight. You know, I've been in ministry long enough to know that this does not only happen outside the church, but it happens inside, inside the church as well. There are some parents, and some of you who might be seated here tonight, who are truly following Jesus. Okay, you love Him, you've been transformed by Him, you are actively pursuing Him, but unfortunately your kids are not. Unfortunately, some of your kids are not. And this is a source of great pain for you. This is a source of great pain and hurt for you because you love your kids so much and you want them to come to Jesus, but you, in your own way, are not willing to compromise your stand in Jesus and your faith in Him. And what we want to say to you parents tonight that we want to stand alongside you in that. We want to stand alongside you and encourage you and pray for you as you continue in this painful journey with kids who do not know Jesus and who refuse to actually come to Him. And you know that you are deeply loved by Him because Jesus identifies with your pain. In Matthew 23, 37, Matthew 23, 37, Jesus looks at Jerusalem. This was sort of uh, towards the end of His ministry on earth. And this is what He says, and He says this in tears. He says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would have I gathered your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. And this is almost a cry of a parent to kids who would refuse to come to God. Jesus is in so, so much anguish here because the people of Jerusalem continue to reject God and they reject His grace and His mercy. They continue to rebel against Him and do their own thing and go their own way. They've been doing this for thousands of years. So parents, you need to know that Jesus empathizes with your pain for your unsaved children. Continue to love them and continue to pray for them and pray that Jesus will ultimately save them. For you who don't have kids yet, know one day you might be faced with that challenge where you are following Jesus, but your kids are not. And we need to ask God's grace and wisdom to be able to navigate through that and to continue to love our kids and pray for their salvation but there might be some sort of division and animosity in the home because the parents are following Jesus. What about the other end of the spectrum, friends? There might be kids here or teens or young adults here who have been saved by Jesus, who love Jesus and are following Him wholeheartedly, but your parents are not. But your parents are not. Perhaps these parents are just church-going, nominal Christians who don't have any relationship with Jesus Christ at all. Jesus sees your struggle as well. Jesus sees your struggle. You know, we encounter so many of those amongst, amongst our teenagers that, that we walk alongside with, that we meet on Sunday mornings. 
because so many one of so so many of them are so torn by this the fact that sometimes there's division in the household because they long to follow Jesus and not to compromise in their relationships but unfortunately their parents see something completely different because they don't follow him and we know your struggle you know you do well to honor your parents while they're still living under their roof and honor them as long as you know them but you're also aware that there will come a day when that chasm between you and your parents will become bigger and much wider and might even cause some sort of division but I want to urge you to carry on loving your parents even though you might not see eye to eye even though your your worldview might not be the same continue to serve them because you you don't actually know that the way you follow Jesus might speak volumes to your parents might be a testimony to them about who Jesus is and might plant a seed in their hearts and you might not be be aware of that continue to pray that those seeds are watered and that they grow and germinate so that one day you will bring your parents to Jesus I've seen this happen a lot over the years where the testimony of young people following Jesus has brought their parents to salvation in Jesus Christ so don't be discouraged friends that that division that might occur within your family because following Jesus sometimes might cost our relationships as he says in our passage tonight perhaps might not cost it to the point where the relationship is completely divided but there will be and there there most definitely will be some sort of tension and animosity then some relationships keep us from following Jesus as well when you look at what Jesus says in our passage tonight some relationships actually keep us from following Jesus and so following Jesus on the one hand might cost us some relationships but some relationships tend to keep us from following Jesus as well Jesus sees and knows the pain that is caused within relationships that are divided because of him but friends make no mistake he also gives us a stark warning for those who allow certain relationships to keep us from completely and wholeheartedly following him in verse 37 and 39 of our text he says this he says whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me and so there are some of us in this room who do believe in Jesus but who continuously refuse to follow him because we love those relationships more than we love Jesus we treasure those relationships more than we treasure Jesus we consider those relationships of more beauty of more value of more worth than the value and worth of knowing Jesus intimately and following him and as a pastor friends I can tell you that this is what brings me the most pain and the most heartache because you get to see front row seats of a whole bunch of stuff you get to see people struggle through you know financial challenges or health issues perhaps cancer or pain caused by certain broken relationships you know in full-time ministry you get to see a lot of that and you get to walk with people through a lot of that but if I was to be honest with you the one thing that breaks me the most is to see people who continuously put Jesus at arm's length because you continually desire the pleasures and joy that you derive from certain relationships not knowing that it pushes you further and further away from the joy and pleasure that only Jesus can give you friends I can't tell you how devastating that is knowing that you can find true pleasure and joy in the one who created you yet you choose to find that in others and because of doing that you continually put Jesus at arm's length I just pray that the Holy Spirit opens your eyes to what you've been missing all along you trade eternal things for temporary fleeting things like the prodigal son you run away from the father because the pleasures of sin are more enticing to you than than the presence of God more often than not it is the relationships in your life that are a cause for that know that the God who loves you was separated from his own father on the cross so that you don't have to be ever separated from him don't willingly choose to be separated from him please don't you are safer in his arms than away from them you so are and I believe for some of you the Holy Spirit is revealing to you some of those relationships that are keeping you from Jesus and you need to ask God's wisdom how to change the nature of those relationships so you don't have to compromise on following Jesus with some of your relationships your allegiance to Jesus might be so compromised that a stronger division may have to occur and a severance to those relationships might have to take place and if that happens if that happens trust that God is 
doing a providential action in your life because he has to draw you to himself. I'm not going to mention names, but we know some of our very friends in this room tonight who God has had to make that happen to such an extent that it's caused you pain because he's trying to wake you up because you've allowed that relationship to break you away from him to the love of God. We often think that only good things and joyous things come from God, but he allows division to occur in some of those relationships because those relationships have slowly been stripping away any semblance of Christ-likeness that we might have had and they've become more and more toxic to our souls. For some of us, those divisions are a wake-up call. You have to wake us up. It's a call of love beckoning us to return back to Jesus. He's saying, please, those divisions are alarm bells ringing that our relationship with our Savior has disintegrated to just a mere acquaintance. Friends have become mere acquaintances. You've disintegrated to that. For some of us, those divisions are an indicator that our relationship with Jesus has stagnated. And because of that, he's had to do something drastic to cause that division. That is the love of God in action, friends. That is the love of God at work. But make no mistake, if you are truly and wholeheartedly following Jesus, there will always be some relationship in your life that will take strain, even to the point of division. And so this is what Jesus meant when he said, I have not come to bring peace but a sword. I have not come to bring peace but a sword. It is a divisive sword because that sword cuts and that sword separates. Okay, it reveals to us who truly are his and those who are not because it cuts to the heart. It reveals to those whose allegiance are to him and those who, whose allegiance are to other people. This sword is not used to kill people like other swords are. It's not used to destroy people. This sword is rather renders a verdict. It is a sword of judgment, what is truly in our hearts. You know, in the recently concluded American elections, I don't think I've ever witnessed such division and animosity amongst people who are on both sides of the political spectrum. In fact, even non-Americans like you and me were so divided by these elections. You know, somehow this generation that we live in thinks that somehow it's okay that if someone has an opposing worldview to you, that you can start bad-mouthing them, insulting someone, trashing them, inflicting violence towards someone just because they have an opposing worldview. It's insane. And it's so scary. You know, the, the, the division that these elections cause, I think, have been unprecedented in modern times. I don't think I've seen an election that has divided people so much. But the division that is caused because of the gospel and because of people who are slowly being changed by Jesus takes on a whole new meaning because here's when the gospel makes all the difference. Because God is not asking you to stop loving those people who are divided with you because of your love for Jesus. Because especially those who have opposing worldviews to you, we ought to love, love them more in spite of the division that is caused. What Jesus is saying here as we see in verse 37 of our text, is that our love for family and friends should never exceed our love for him. That's what he actually means when he say that. He's not saying we should stop loving those who are close to us, but he's saying that our love for family and friends should never exceed our love for him. Our love for those who are opposed to us should pale in comparison to our love for him. Jesus is really tugging at our hearts because the tendency of our sinful nature is to default towards giving in to those relationships, right? Because we just want to be so included in those friendships because that's what's in front of us right now. Because he's asking us to just stop and think for a moment. Just stop and think for a moment to ponder what really is at stake here. He is saying that you cannot wholeheartedly love him and those who are opposed to him at the same time. Let me just repeat that. Let, let that just sink in. You cannot wholeheartedly love Jesus on the one hand, and wholeheartedly love those who are opposed to him at the same time. There will inevitably be a compromise on one side or the other. He is saying that that compromise should be in the direction of others and not in the direction of him. He's saying that if there is to be a compromise, it should be in the direction of, of others and not him. These are very hard words, friends, because they involve those who are closest to us, and they become harder to swallow. And, and painful to digest more than some of the other teachings of Jesus that we looked at this last, last little while. 
But the key to really getting all of this is in verse 39 of our text. Because he says, whoever finds his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, for my sake, that is what we need to be looking at. That is what we need to be highlighting because ultimately it is all about him. Because as a Christian, we exist for him and his glory, for his name to be made famous. But his name will never be made famous through us if we're still holding on to our own lives, still holding on to our own fame, still holding on to our own popularity, still holding on to certain relationships. We ought to be prepared to lose our lives and our popularity and our fame for his sake because he gave up his life for our sake. Friends, the price that was paid so that the stark contrast, the stark division between light and darkness could be made visible to us, that price was the highest price possible, his own life his own blood because without Jesus you would never know that you are in darkness you would never know that you are in darkness the light of the world had to come into the darkness of the world so that those of us who are in darkness could see the light and could respond to it so how are we going to respond to this sword that divides the light and the darkness are you going to continue with one foot in the darkness and continue with the other foot in the light because a lot of us do that. That division between light and dark needs to be so stark and so clear. Because ultimately, friends, it is the cross of Jesus Christ that divides history into those who would be loved and who would be known by him and those who would be rejected and who would be banished by him because they have chosen so. Not because he has chosen so. Because they have chosen so. More than that, the cross of Christ, friends, screams God's love for you in saying wake up for your slumber in darkness and open your eyes to the light because you have no more excuse as to not to be able to tell the difference between the two because the cross is that dividing line between history because there is no more gray area friends God's love for us through his son has made it so abundantly clear as to the side that we need to choose because his cross is like that sword that splits the two sides right in the middle and I believe that's what Jesus said or meant when he said, I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. You know what? I thank God for his grace in making these things so clear to us. That is no more gray areas. Because we're, we're reaching a point in history where the world actually tries to blur those lines. You know what I mean? It tries to blur those lines. Whereas the gospel of Jesus Christ stands as the clear dividing line between good and evil, between darkness and light. In this instance, we can thank God that He is a divisive God. We can actually thank Him that He is a divisive God because He's made things so starkly clear. Otherwise, we would all perish on the one side. All of us would. We thank God that, is, that there is a division because that means we have an option. Think about it. We have an option. Without that dividing line, that dividing sword, we would never have an option. That option would have never existed if Jesus had not entered into mankind and lived the life that we could never live and died the death that we should have died, that dividing line in the sand would never have been possible. He took our place for our sins and paid the ultimate price so that that division could occur. So that that division could occur. And we need to thank God for His grace and mercy in doing, in doing that. And thank God that in, in this instance, He is divisive so that you and I have that option to choose between life or death. Between life or death. Yes, God is a uniting God. Yes, He unites those who are under Him and under His grace and His mercy. But between us and the world, between light and darkness, between good and evil, that dividing line has been made so clear. And we ought to be grateful for Him. And so we really need to ask God for wisdom, to navigate through those relationships that become divided because of Him. Because if we were to be honest with ourselves, some of those relationships that are divided in our lives is not because we are following Jesus. It's because of our own stupidity, because of our own, um, you know, self-centeredness, because of our own foolishness. Um, and sometimes there is tension and animosity in those relationships because of us. But what we're saying here tonight is if there is tension and animosity and division 
in those relationships that we have because of Jesus Christ. Perhaps it's there for a reason. And if it's those who are very close to us, we need the grace of God to navigate through those relationships so that we can carry on loving them despite that division and carry on showing God's grace and mercy in their, in their lives so that they will ultimately get to know Him the way we know Him. He can tend to be a device of God. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. I have come to set father against son, mother against daughter. You know, these things are very close and personal to us. You know, in, in my own family, I experienced that, in my own extended family. But yet, I just trust that all I need to do is just carry on loving Jesus and following Him uh, despite sometimes the tension and animosity that might exist, somehow God would save them. Somehow He would. And He's given us a clear warning 2,000 years ago that these divisions are bound to happen. And we will need to thank Him for that as well. Even between family members, even between parents and kids, even between siblings, even between friends. Let's ask for wisdom to navigate through that. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your love for us. Lord, your words, as we see every week, they get harder and harder to even contemplate. Never mind begin to put them into practice in our lives. But we just thank you that your cross was a dividing line between history so that, Lord, the clear contrast between light and darkness could be, could be made by, our, by us. So we could have the option of choosing life and not death. And Father, we just ask for your hand of healing on those tonight who have divided relationships because they are following you. And may they be able to, to, to navigate through that and continue to extend a hand of grace and mercy in those relationships. Father, heal those wounds that are hurt because of those divisive relationships. And Father, I want to pray for those in the room who, who have been lukewarm, who don't even have one single relationship that is divided. Perhaps they haven't really been following you the way that they should. We just ask that they would understand the meaning of this gospel that has saved us and that is transforming us. Father, show us what it means to love you. And even if it costs some relationships, may we not compromise on that. Father, and may we never allow certain relationships to keep us from knowing your son, to keep us from knowing the greatest treasure we could ever have. Lord, we want to say that we love you. You are our greatest joy and our greatest treasure. And as we carry on entering into a time of worship, may we truly surrender our hearts to you and our pains to you and all those relationships to you, whether they keep us from following you or whether they cost us following you, whatever the case may be, May we truly worship you with our lives. In Jesus Christ's name, we pray. Amen. We're going we're to spend some time really in the presence of God and really worshiping Him. And so allow Him to heal your hearts if you have divided relationships because of Him. But if you're truly following Jesus, just love Him. Just carry on loving Him and just thank Him for what He's done for you. So let's stand together and worship.